This is a cake you can make way, way ahead. It is the most outstanding and impressive looking cake that I have ever seen Rosh Hashanah wise. And we think it's gonna shake up everybody's Rosh Hashanah this year. And it's quite simple to make. It's just a matter of following the steps and planning ahead. So I'm gonna run you through it and show you how easy it is to do. So let's start with the ingredients. We're gonna make, there's just a bit of a thing with the quantity. So in the book, we've got, let's say the full quantity of dough and full quantity of filling, which makes a really big cake. But we think because of these times, because people aren't making as big of things as they used to, we're gonna make it a bit smaller. So the idea is we're gonna make a full quantity of the dough or the pastry layers. We're gonna put half in the freezer for another day and we're gonna use half the filling mixture from the book and make a smaller size but beautiful cake. And it almost looks nicer than the original because the layers are a bit smaller and you've still got eight. So it sort of looks proportionally better because it's higher and more impressive. But you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. Okay, so what you're gonna need is a saucepan on the stove with about an inch or two of water that's come to the boil with a bowl on the top that fits snugly into it. Sorry, you're gonna get a bit of a facial there. Is that right? That's okay. So just careful of the heat. I might turn it down a tiny bit. So you want the water boiling with it with a um, bowl sitting on the top nicely. And we're gonna put our ingredients into the bowl. This is what we're gonna need. We need 125 grams of butter, which has been chopped. And I always use unsalted butter for baking. Um, and it's been sitting out all day and I'm gonna use it. So it's going to melt nicely into the mixture. Three quarters of a cup of caster sugar. I always use caster sugar for baking, are you the same? Yes, yeah. I will use but because it dissolves quicker. But if you don't have caster sugar, by all means use white sugar. Two eggs and quarter of a cup or 90 grams of honey. And what I'd actually do is I would measure everything straight into that bowl, but I wanted to show you all the things because we all know how hard honey is to get out when yes. you've measured it. Um, one little tip um, that I can give you is that it's always a good idea to spray whatever you're measuring the honey in with a bit of olive oil spray or something. And that way the honey will come out really, really easily or do what I've just done and put it in the microwave yes. for 15 seconds. But be careful when you put it in the yes. microwave because <laughs> it boils over quite quickly. And we just had a little bit of an explosion in the microwave. <laughs> and I was going to keep that quiet. <laughs> we had honey all over the microwave, but that's another story. And then you'll need 600 grams or four cups of plain flour and two teaspoons of baking soda or bicarbonate of soda. So everything is going into the bowl except for the flour and the baking soda. I should just explain what this cake is about. We're making eight discs. They're sort of like biscuits, honey biscuit discs, about so big. And we're going to make a filling with cream cheese and cream. And we're gonna layer the biscuits with the cream cheese filling, cover it with the filling and put it in the fridge for two days and there's your cake. So I should have said that at the beginning. Now we're gonna make the pastry or biscuit layers. And the first thing we need to do is the mixture that's gonna make the most beautiful dough. I think you'll be very excited with this dough. It's something very special. So into this bowl, we're gonna put pretty much everything that I've spoken about. We're gonna put the sugar, the, the butter. Oh, then you can put the butter in for me. I'm gonna put the eggs one at a time. Um, I'll put one egg and if you can start mixing it together. The thing about eggs and sugar is that you don't want to let your eggs sit on top of your sugar without beating because you'll get some granules forming in the yolks that you'll never get rid of. Okay, and another egg and the honey. So you can see everything is in there together and it looks like a very sludgy, uninteresting mixture. I wouldn't say it looks delicious yet. Would you agree with that? I, I would. <laughs> can you all, yeah, you can all see what's in it. So it looks like scrambled eggs at the moment. Little bits of butter, which are slowly starting to melt. And the idea is that the butter slowly melts into the mixture. Just step over a bit. I can see that you're coming towards me. You're out of the picture and we need you in the picture. So I know we're supposed to be social distancing, but come a bit closer. Um, it's going to become smooth in a minute and then and Lynn's the job today, dissolve. the sugar will dissolve, the butter will slowly melt, um, and we'll start to emulsify, I think, the eggs into the mixture. And Lynn is here today to whisk for 10 minutes. <laughs> Can I give you that job? I'm so excited. <laughs> so this is the hardest part of the, of the dough, is that you need to stand there for about 10 minutes and just whisk it 
The heat is on medium now, the water is simmering nicely, and it's just a matter of waiting for it to thicken. It's not gonna thicken like a really thick custard, but it's going to be thicker than it is now. So um, while we're doing that, we can actually start talking about making the discs and then maybe we can talk about the rest of the Rosh Hashanah menu while we're waiting Fantastic. for that. Fantastic. So I'll just get ready for the next step. So as soon as this is thickened, we're gonna add the bicarb soda. For those of you who have ever made honeycomb, you add the bicarb to the caramel right. mixture and it puffs up. This is sort of the same. You're not gonna get quite the reaction, but it is going to add air into that mixture and lighten it. Right. And then the flour goes in once that cools down for a minute and it makes this beautiful, smooth, warm dough that is such a pleasure to deal with and a pleasure to roll out. So that's the next step. So what we need to do is work out how we're going to measure the circles, which is, it's not a tricky part once you know it, but when you read the recipe, you might think, ah, oh, what do I do? For the size we're making, we need a 14 centimeter disc template, right. whatever. I have worked out that this bowl, which is just my cereal bowl, is 14 centimeters, and that's the size I'm gonna use. So I need the actual recipe, the full recipe makes a bigger cake. Yeah, so the full recipe makes 20 centimetres. Right. Um, and I just use a cake tin, like a spring foam cake tin base right. to right. be my stencil. Right. But I, I worked out mathematically, you'll be pleased to know, <laughs> um, what size diameter you need to halve the recipe. Okay. And you need a seven centimetre diameter, which is a, sorry, seven centimetre radius, which is a 14 centimetre right. diameter bowl. And that's the size of the cake. It looks quite small, but you'll see when it's baked and it um, rises in the oven and then you layer it, it's actually a beautiful size cake. So get your 14 centimetre template. You're gonna need a rolling pin and some baking paper. And I'll show you shortly how it's done. Okay, so how's that going? I think it's starting to thicken a little. Okay, so I'll give it another few minutes. Okay. Um, and let's talk about other things while we're waiting for this to, to um, thicken. So let's talk about Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. And the menu. And what we normally or usually yeah. do on Rosh Hashanah is we all gather together and we have Rosh Hashanah with our family mm. and we have a big dinner. Yeah. And this year it's going to be different. Yeah. But the one thing that hasn't changed. It's the food. It's the food. It's so true. It's so true. And even for people that are tuning in from Melbourne, and I always like to give a shout out to all of you in Melbourne and say, yes. hey, we're really thinking of Absolutely. you and fingers crossed and everything crossed that, that in two weeks you'll be out of lockdown or two weeks and one day, I think it is. Um, and Rosh Hashanah for you will also be different. But again, same food, just smaller quantities. So I think that it's good to think about what you're going to make for Rosh Hashanah in the sense of choosing things that are going to keep that you can eat or reimagine the next day. Um, for me, the highlight of my Rosh Hashanah meal this year is going to be brisket. And I love a good brisket. I love, a, I love it for a number of reasons. Number one, it's so, the brisket I'm gonna share with you, it's, it's really easy. Pretty much you're gonna have your whole meal in one pot. Your vegetables, your potatoes, your meat, and your Rosh Hashanah sweetness all in one pot together. So that to me is a win-win and you stick it in the oven and, and it cooks for three, four hours. So you really, there's nothing to do. Nothing to do last minute and it's just an outstanding dish. And the thing about brisket is if there's only two of you and you still get your kilo of brisket um, and you eat, let's say, mm, I don't know, a third of it, the next day you can reimagine it in so Absolutely. many ways. Absolutely. Like I would love to make like a, um, toasted sandwich with brisket. You make a salad with beautiful, with cabbage and fennel and pickled onions and have, have some shredded brisket on it that you've warmed Absolutely. up you in the oven. You could put it into a wrap. That's right, a wrap. I was gonna say like a, I would actually make a pie. Um, you know, you could make a beautiful pie with phyllo pastry and, and brisket in it. There's so many ways. And you can also put it in the freezer for another day. So there's lots of things with brisket. Um, there's a question here. I said um, bicarb. So yeah, two teaspoons of bicarbonate of soda only in this dough, no baking powder. Um, okay, so someone's asked about which brisket, beef or veal. I grew up, um, for those of you who have got our first book, we, I talk about my mother's 
Um, she calls it calf brisket, and that's what they called it back in the day. Right. And it's really a baby a little veal. And it's on the bone, and if you go to the butcher, it's called a breast of veal. And to me, that's my favourite cut of brisket. And the way she cooks it, which is in the book, is just smothered with onions and cooked for hours and basted for hours. And it is sticky and delicious and sweet, and the meat is so soft. Um, but a beef brisket is different. Do you have, I mean, sometimes I have trouble with beef brisket because, yes, yeah, it can be tough. It can be tough and everyone has the same problem. And the solution to that, I think, is partly make sure you get a brisket that's really well marbled um, with fat. I know we all don't like fat. Some of us don't actually do. Um, make but sure it's what fat. It, has to be. it needs to be not lean. If it's lean, it's not going to... It's not going to be soft and succulent. So you need a well marbled piece of brisket. Remember that one part of the brisket is lean. There's nothing you can do about it. And it is going to be a little bit tougher than the rest of it. But the rest of it should be deliciously succulent. Um, okay, someone said, um, can you give the exact ingredients of this honey cake? They're exactly the same as in the book, um, except that we are halving the filling. Um, everything's exactly, exactly the same. And just to run through the ingredients again, we have got in here 125 grams of butter, which is half a block, unsalted at room temperature, three quarters of a cup of caster sugar, two eggs, and a quarter of a cup or 90 grams of honey in there. And Lynn is doing an excellent job stirring away over boiling water because we want to um, cook this mixture slightly to emulsify it before we go on to the next step. So we're pretty much cooking the eggs. Yeah. Slowly though. And then we've got four cups or 600 grams of flour and two teaspoons of baking soda or bicarb. And how do you know when it's ready? How do you know when it's ready to? You know what, I just do it by time and then right. have a look at it and see if it's really getting thicker. And I think we'll give it, I'm going to turn it up again and give it another couple minutes. Okay. And then it will be ready to go to the next step. So about step. 10 minutes. Yeah, about 10 okay. minutes. And you just want it slightly thick and definitely smooth. No lumps, um, No, definitely no lumps of butter. Um, so back to the brisket. So what I love about our brisket, this is what you do. So you fry some onions because every good Jewish recipe has to start with fried onions. Agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Always. I remember when we were talking about our first or second book, we were laughing that we should just call it, um, or was it, was it the book we did together? Maybe we were laughing about it, that you should just call it start with an onion <laughs> because every, every savory recipe, fried onion. Um, and I love them. So you fry some onions. You put half of the fried onions um, into the roasting pan. Now, if you want the recipe for this, you need to go to our website, which is mondaymorningcookingclub.com.au, and we have the brisket recipe there um, with some photos, so you can just follow along. In the bake, in the roasting pan, onion, raw brisket, onion on top, and then we toss some carrots, big chunks of carrots with some brown sugar, and um, put that in as well. Cut up some Desiree potatoes, Put them in as well and I'm just going to check my recipe because I have forgotten. Okay, we're going to drizzle it with honey, season it very well with salt and pepper, put a cinnamon stick in, a couple of pieces of orange rind, cover it with a bit of baking paper, then with foil and put it in the oven for two hours. That's step one. I mean that's super easy. Really easy. After the two hours, take it out, take the foil off, add some prunes, we need prunes to Rosh Hashanah, and then put it back in without the cover, without the foil, and start basting and basting it. At that point, the vegetables start to caramelize, the honey does its work, the prunes start to sort of melt into the sauce and the meat, and you get this super succulent, sweet, sort of charred on the edges brisket that I think you'll all think it's the best yeah. thing. And it's my Sounds best, delicious. my favorite Rosh Hashanah brisket. Um, it's a really good thing. This is the picture here. Can I show the picture? It's a picture of what it looks like, and it's really yummy. And you don't need to have side dishes because everything is in there. That's, that's what I love about it. It's like just a one pot dish. All right, so that's the brisket story. And what would you serve the brisket with? So many things. So well, many things. you don't need your potatoes, that's done. You don't need your veggies, that's done. But I think you always need um, a fresh green salad. Um, and my just favorite, green leaves. just green leaves. I, I'm an iceberg person. Um, I love nothing more than buying a really solid iceberg lettuce. I always go around, I'm the person in the fruit shop that's like squeezing the icebergs. I want it to be really hard. Yes. I'm going to take the outside leaves off and keep them for something else. Maybe I was talking last night to someone actually about making pea and lettuce soup with the, oh, um, right. with the leaves. Like yes. for those of you who've got the Greta Anna cookbooks, I don't know if you, 
if you so so people who grew up i think in australia in the 70s what an 80s would know greta anna and in her one of her two cookbooks she has pea and lettuce soup which is really good um so green salad iceberg or cos yes i, I, know, know, I, 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 I love cos yes. sometimes they're too loose though you see yes, you need some yes, time. yes, yes. Um, baby cost, okay. Very good, yes. very good. So I'd do a mixture of iceberg and baby cos. Mm -hmm. I'd add some chopped chives. Yes. I'd cut some avocado up and put some lemon juice on it to add later. Mm -hmm. There's my salad. Absolutely. Um, and of course, my favourite vinaigrette dressing, which um, you can also find on the website. That's, that's vinaigrette dressing. Do you love that? I love it. Yeah. I love okay. um, So that's what I would do. I would do that main cos with... Um, a salad, and that really could be your main Absolutely. course. Or um, even some street, um, some steamed green beans. Yeah, actually, I was beautiful. thinking it probably needs a green veg. Um, beans would be great, but they're very last minute though. Like that's my yes. only problem yes. with beans. Yes. And I like doing spinach, like wilted spinach. That you, I know it's a pain because you've got to get this much spinach to get yes. this much spinach. Absolutely. But if you wash it really well and then steam it quickly in a pan with the lid on, sort of a few handfuls at a time, then. Um, Put it aside, put a bit of butter in or margarine or olive oil, lots of salt and pepper, and then it's ready to reheat later. Yes. And I love it. Yes. Okay, let's get back to this. All right, I think that looks good. Let's go on to the next stage. So I'm going to turn this off. Thank you. Careful. Careful, yeah. Do you want to put that? Just put that on the side. Thanks, then. So nice to have you here, Lynn. I love a helping hand. So nice to be here. So we've got this mixture in here. It smells, you know what I'm going to say, it smells like Rosh Hashanah. Doesn't it? It's, really it's, it's good. honey, it's beautiful. Really, really good. Beautiful. And I'm now going to change from the whisk to a spoon. And I'm going to add the bicarb. Um, what am I going to add? Yeah. And now I'm adding the bicarb in. And what's going to happen, um, and you can see the bowl, it's going to start to froth up. I'm just going to give it a minute, that's all. This is, and this dough reminds me of making Play Doh. Um, I think there was a, a phase with when the kids were little that we used to make our own Play-Doh at home and it's like this warm, smooth thing. And I think this is pretty much exactly what it's gonna be. I probably could have sifted it. Oh, oh there's a few lumps, but they'll disappear. That's all right. Now it's really, you can see it's really starting Beautiful. to thicken. Beautiful. And in a minute, there will be even more bubbles. You can see the bubbles are yes, forming. Yes. We just wanna get it to start bubbling and thickening smells beautiful looks thick and lovely it's really quite thick now i'm just going to give it a few more minutes sorry a few more seconds okay you can see the bubbles are forming okay so that's what we want that's going to aerate our um biscuit layers just to make them have more volume and not be as tough i guess okay that's enough now i'm going to add in the flour i'm going to start with half now, if you add it all, it's just too hard to deal with. And the, the great thing about this recipe, you know, you're all watching thinking, wow, you know, she knows what she's doing. But I, I didn't know what I was doing when we got this recipe. We got it, we followed it, we tried slowly, we worked out how to best make it. And over the year, probably two years that we've had this recipe, we have mastered it because my view is that any recipe is doable by anybody the second time you do it. First yes. time, uh -uh, what are we doing? Second time, and you'll be making it like I make it in, a, in one minute, you'll see. It's such a great recipe. And it's so much fun to make because this dough is divine, you'll see. So I've got all my flour in and I'm just mixing it gently. Wonderful, and by hand, yeah, my machine. machine's here. Fantastic. And it will come together in two seconds and it's really easy Over to roll. That. What I want to tell you also is that you can make this dough ahead right? and probably halve it and label it and put it in the freezer. And okay. then when you want to make the discs next week or the week after, they're there and ready to go. Fantastic. I will oh, say... Look at that beautiful dough. I wish you could all see it <laughs> close up. It's fantastic. When you make it, when you roll it from dough that's still warm and just made, it's slightly easier to roll. The one from the freezer... Still easy, but just takes a tiny bit more work. This is, right. you'll see how amazing this is. And you don't even need flour when you roll it out. Okay, right. so that's it. I've got a habit I've realized through doing all these Zooms that I say that's it before that's it. I always do it. I say, okay, 
this is enough mixing and then I'll keep mixing. So <laughs> it's nearly it. I'm just gonna give it one more mix. All right, I think that's good. So beautiful. Favorite utensil, favorite. isn't it? Favorite. Pastry scape scraper must cost four dollars. Can't live without it. Okay. Okay. So I'm just gonna put it onto the bench top. Of that. Oh, Excuse me. You have to feel the stir. No, you, you don't it's understand. Isn't it beautiful? I'm just going to give it a quick knead because right. I just want to smooth it out a little bit. It is warm and smooth and smells like Rosh Hashanah. Beautiful. I mean, it feels like beautiful. It is beautiful. Like, there's something about warm dough. You don't often make something, you don't often make dishes with warm dough. It's an interesting concept. So I'm very excited to have this. Okay. So, it's because we always told that when you make a dough, then you put it aside. That's right. And the butter's either cold or you need exactly. the fridge to rest. Exactly. So that's the dough. That's as easy as it is. And if I would weigh it now and divide it properly because I don't want layers to be different heights. But for the purposes of today, I think we can just actually skip that. Right. And we'll just go, we're just going to roll two anyway because I have made, look how easily it cuts. I mean, Fantastic. I wish you could feel... Um, all of you watching how beautiful it is to, to work with and to cut. It's just fantastic. So we're dividing it into eight. Right. And I'm going to just put these aside for later. Oh, it's just, I mean, I just want to show you how beautiful this dough is. It's, it's something it's extraordinary, it's really actually. It's beautiful. I know you think I'm going on a lot about the dough, but, but really, it really, really is, is it amazing. really worth going on about. And what you need is your piece of baking paper and your rolling pin. You don't need flour. Right. You take a ball of the dough and you just make a little circle with it, a little ball with it, I should say. Mm. Place it on your baking paper. Ah, oh, you know what I haven't done? Luckily, I remembered. I want to halve the dough, actually, because I'm making a half size. Right. So um, each of these, actually, now, I'm happy I remember that. Okay, so each of these okay, okay. will be a thing. Yeah, okay. okay. So you understand that the recipe, the original recipe, has a batch of dough and a batch of filling. We made the whole batch of dough. We are only using half of it today and half's going in the freezer for another day. Right. So we're using the smaller... Yeah, because we're using the smaller um, template. Yeah. So it's now a small bowl of dough. I've divided half the dough into eight, right. and this is one of the circles. And I'm just going to gently roll it out. You don't need any flour. You can see how absolutely beautiful it is to work with. And it is definitely easier to do this than it is when you've taken it out of the freezer right. or something, right. but it's still doable. Okay. Right. This stage can be done. So the biscuits can be made and cooked three days, four days, maybe a week, as long as you keep a biscuit right. um, before right. you fill it. Okay. So it's very do ahead. So we're trying to get it as close to the circle size that we're going to use as the template. And that to me looks pretty good. And if you make your circles too big, keep the scraps and make a ninth layer. Oh, okay. okay so okay. I'm going to put this on. Got a little sharp knife and I'm just going to go around it. Take the scraps away. Perfect. And you can see I have a beautiful circle. And I'm just going to put this paper on my baking sheet. So there's no transferring the dough. There's no problems with it. And I'm just going to put it straight onto this. Um, just like that. And I'll just quickly do a second one um, on a little piece of paper. Do you mind holding that for a day? So you can see how easy it is. And the idea is to do eight circles like that or nine if you've got scraps. So actually when you look at the photograph of this beautiful cake yeah. in the book, it looks like it's very daunting. Absolutely. And when you see how easy it is, actually it's really quite simple. It, re it really is. And that's what I'm saying. Like everyone will say, wow, I couldn't do that. But I promise you, do it once. And the second time you'll do it with your eyes closed. It's, it's, this is about my fourth one in the last two weeks. And I, it's, it's become a go-to special cake. So please try it and you'll see how simple it is. Okay, again, no flour needed at all. Use my template. 
And I want to show you, see, I've done a bad job here on purpose because it doesn't matter. Okay, because it's all going to be covered with the filling. So you can see that I've left a corner off and it's not so perfect. And I want to show you that all you need to do is take that little bit and patch it together. Just like that, no one will see it, okay? It really can be as rough as that. Okay, so that's the second one. And that can go in the oven um, for five to six minutes. That's it. So, yes, please. So five to six minutes in the oven. And what I do while they're in the oven, I would roll the next two and that would come out. I'd put the new ones onto the hot baking sheet and it would probably need four minutes because it's already hot. And just keep doing just keep doing till your eight or nine are done. Um, so someone said, can you freeze them cooked? Absolutely. Yes, you could. 100%. Um, what temperature? 200 degrees. So there'll be five minutes. But in the meantime, I can show you that the ones I've made before. So these could be in the freezer for a month. They can be in the, in the pantry in an airtight container for a week. Absolutely beautiful. And that's it. This is what they're going to look like. And you'll see mine when they come out of the oven. Sometimes they're a bit crisper than other times. Sometimes they're a bit softer. Right. It just doesn't matter. It is so forgiving. Um, how good does that smell? <laughs> it smells just Absolutely. beautiful. A beautiful honey biscuit. I wish so, you could sell, send the smell through Zoom to everybody because it's just, they're just beautiful. So we can actually fill um, these ones now and okay. show you okay. how to do it. Fantastic. Right. So everybody can see those lovely things. That's probably too hot. I'll just put it in there. Okay. So how are we going for time? Okay, great. So you can see, I want you to see how uneven they are, how imperfect they are. Um, it, and it just, as I said, it really, really doesn't matter. And you'll see the one I made earlier, which is beautiful on the outside and full of imperfect discs on the inside. All right, let's talk filling. So the essential part about this filling is that it's made with cream cheese. And if you're going to work with cream cheese, it has to, has to, has to be at room temperature. Because if it's not at room temperature and you it's try to hard. whisk it, it's just, you'll be there all day. So please take it out. I took mine out last night, actually. I'm not recommending you do that. You decide how often you want, how long you want to leave it out for. But when it's not a hot day, um, it can stay out as butter can all night without a problem. If you have forgotten to take it out, which we all do from time to time, microwave it really, really gently. Start with 10 seconds, see how it goes, add another 10 seconds. So, because mine has been out, it is super soft. And let's run through these filling ingredients. I want to tell you, this is a good time to tell you that there is a mistake in our cookbook. There are actually three mistakes in the cookbook. And this is the one that upsets me the most because in the filling, it says 500 mils of pure cream and it actually needs to be thickened cream. Okay. Right. It's okay. really important. If you use pure cream, like pouring cream, and you don't whip it first and you put it in the filling, it's going to separate and you'll never get it back. I've tried 8,000 times. So um, it's very heartbreaking for all of us. We worked so many years on these books and there's always always a mistake somewhere that people have missed. And this is one of the three, the other two are minor. Um, so thickened cream, so this is what we've got. We've got one block of cream cheese, which is 250 grams. Mm -hmm. I have 60 grams of icing sugar. And it's pure icing sugar. Well, I don't think it has to be for this recipe. Okay. Um, I think any, pure or the, or the, um, soft, or the soft one. I, okay. I like the soft one. I do. It's much easier to work with. It is. Um, and what they, what they say is that if you're making a icing that you want it to be particularly shiny and glossy and smooth, then you use the pure. And right. if it's in a filling or something and it doesn't matter, okay. then it doesn't matter. Right. So I sort of Good follow that. Know. Okay. Um, and 250 mils of thickened cream. So four things in the icing, cream cheese, icing sugar, honey. Did I say honey? Yeah. No, two tablespoons of honey and thickened cream and chopped roasted walnuts for garnish, if you like, optional, completely optional. So this is the filling. Again, I have half the recipe in the book for the filling because we've put half the dough in the freezer and we're building discs with half of the, the other half of the dough. Okay. Okay, so let's put this. 
You can do this with a um, handheld mixer. You can do it by hand as well if you're right. strong. Right. And in a food processor? Yeah, absolutely. you could do that as well. Because sometimes yeah. I, I yeah. find that cream cheese in the food processor is easier than in a... In to a, get smooth. Yes. But I wonder what will happen when you add I the thick and cream in. That's the only know. thing. So excuse the noise for one second. Um, okay, so Lorraine's asked, have we ever used power of whip and non-dairy cream cheese? We spoke about yeah, that. Yeah, we did. This is not a power of whip. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I haven't. So. And I guess it's up to you to try. Yeah. You could try, you know, put Nathalex in the dough yeah. and yeah. try... The power of cream cheese. But, but I don't know what power of cream cheese tastes like if it is... The cream cheese flavour really comes through. So give it a go. Yeah. And know? I'm not sure if the power of whip is... Could be as good as a thickened cream. Yeah. Okay, so excuse the noise for one second. We're just whisking it. I just want it to be smooth and a little bit fluffy. How are they looking? Perfect. Oh, perfect. All right. So. Look at that. So you can see now, I wanted to show you. They are soft. They're hot. <laughs> They're soft now. Um, and they will harden as they cool. Um, as yes. I said earlier, I would then put those onto my kitchen bench and I would roll the next two and put it on the baking tray and um, cook the next ones on a hot tray in the oven, but give it a minute less because the tray is already hot. So you've already sort of started the cooking time. Um, so that's your two discs and we've got eight or nine in total that we're going to make, but we're not going to make them now because I've done them ahead. So we're just carrying on with the filling. So. One more minute of noise. Okay, and, and I think if we weren't doing it on Zoom live, I would probably whip it for a bit longer right. because I do want it to be quite light and fluffy. Um, but let's not do that now because it won't matter for the purposes of today. Okay. Um, now I'm going to add in the honey. And again, my honey's gone a bit, um, you know, it's gone solid because it's been sitting out. Let me see if we can get it out. Yeah. Okay. So honey and the icing sugar goes in and then we're going to beat that together till smooth. I measured everything last night and now everything's <laughs> stuck in there. Okay. Again, cream cheese, icing sugar, and honey in here. And that's already a beautiful mixture. Like that's already something that you want to dive into and lift your finger if no one was watching. How much icing sugar? Okay, so yes, I said Philly, Philly cream cheese, 250 grams of Philadelphia cream cheese, 60 grams of icing sugar, and 45 grams or two tablespoons of honey. So I'm just gonna mix that together till it's nice and smooth. Always give it a scrape down. These machines yeah. always need it. Beautiful. I'll tell you what I learned the other day about these machines. You know, sometimes it doesn't quite reach the bottom. Yeah. Yep. So there's a little Phillips oh, head screw right. in there. Okay. And you get a Phillips head screwdriver and you turn it one way, I don't know which, and it lowers and raises the beater. But you've got to be careful. I did it too much and it scratched my the enamel off my beater. Right. But it's actually really good to know because sometimes it doesn't reach yes. the bottom. Yes. All right, Especially so when you're it. making half quantities. Exactly. Yeah. So that's it. There is our the base of our filling and now we're going to add the cream. So this is one cup, 250 ml of thickened cream. Um, somebody's asked what sort of honey. I use super master honey for baking. I find it the best. I don't want lavender. Right. I don't want eucalyptus. Yes. I want... Um, I am using... What brand is that? I think I'm even using Cole's brand. Or Woolworths friend. Yeah, I'm happy with any of those unflavoured honeys. Yeah. Um, I like Beechworth a lot. They do yeah. the one and a half kilo tubs, but they were out. Okay, so the honey, the cream's going in. And we just want to whisk it until it has a spreadable consistency. That's all it. We'll take a minute and that's it. So it's still a bit a bit loose and right. it'll just slosh okay. everywhere. So I'm right. just going to give it another minute. Okay. 30 seconds and we'll see how it goes. Just be 
careful with when you're whipping anything with cream in it because it's, it takes but a second to go from beautiful honey filling to honey butter, which is not what we're after no, today. No, I've actually made butter by accident, have you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> did you eat the butter? No. I think I did. did you? Yeah. Okay. So you can see when your mix master makes, when your whisk makes <sighs> um, like definite lines in the mixture, you know that it's ready. Okay. Yes. So that's the mixture ready. Beautiful. I'm just going to get rid of this. Beautiful. Okay, thank you. All right, so that's the mixing done. And now is the fun part. All right. Think about what you're going to serve this on. I love baking paper as an underlay for things. So I would choose my piece of baking paper. Oh, thank you. Um, this is probably too big to serve it on. So I'm going to think about it. I'm going to probably tear it, I'm going to tear it like this or get a new piece because depending on how you store it, you're going, you're going to need to lift it out of your container. And you need right. to think about that. Because right. if you just made this in your container, it's very hard to get out once it's iced um, and, and whatever. So, okay, so I'm trying to make a nice piece of baking paper and I'm gonna start this way. If you wanna be particular, you can weigh this and divide it into um, probably 10 and use a bit, one part for each layer and then two parts for the outside. Yeah. Right, right, right. But let's just wing it and see how we go. All right, can you all see that nicely? Yep. Okay, because you just need a blob like that and a very good tool for this is this either a mini one or this one and you don't need to be too meticulous about spreading it because you know that when you put the next one on it's going to go out to the edges okay so that's the next one and what I like to do um, <laughs> what I end up doing not what I like to do which is not ideal is that I end up using less on the bottom layers and more on the top. So my filling goes <laughs> right because I'm uncertain. Really not sure. So okay. weighing it would really solve that problem, but let's not worry about that. So a dollop on top. And this is like craft. This is fun. I, I like this sort of thing. You know, the layers are made, the fillings made. It's nothing complicated about it. It's a beautiful mixture. Okay. And we're just going to keep it going. And if you put too much filling on as you get higher, it doesn't matter because it's just going to come out the sides and oh, drip and down anyway. anyway. So you see that's a bit thicker. Those of you who are judging me, you can see that that's thicker than the other. So I'm going to press it a bit more so it comes out. For those of you who live in Melbourne, you'll remember the chocolate ripple cake. You never had, they never yes. had it in Sydney, yes. um, which is a, a chocolate used to buy a chocolate biscuit made by Arnott's, which was chocolate flavoured, not chocolate coated, and used to layer it with whipped cream and yes, sugar. Yes. Cream with sugar, layer it in a log and cover it with cream, and the biscuits would go soft, and then you'd cut it on the diagonal and you'd have this cake. This is the same concept. Right. Um, it's going to be a soft, cuttable cake, you'll see when it's finished, that is so divine. Um, just back to the Rosh Hashanah meal for a minute while yes. I'm doing this. Yes, yes. Um, I think... I think we've got the brisket, the green salad, either green beans or, or spinach. spinach on the side, and that's it. I don't think you need anything no, else I don't for think main we course. Need anything else. But we didn't, we didn't speak about chicken soup. No, we didn't. So you have to have chicken you soup have because chicken what soup. is Rosh Hashanah without exactly. chicken soup? The question is, what are you going to put in your chicken soup? Krepla, lokshan, um, matzo balls. Matzo I know, balls. I know, I know. It's just I'm not sure about matzo balls. I'm also not sure. Thing. I think that. Um, a lot of people have matzo balls. My and family loves matzo balls. On yontif, yeah, because yeah, it's yeah. yontif and we're having matzo balls. Um, I do love lakshan and I do love kreplach, um, I, but I think it's just a personal taste and often something that's tradition. So it's something that your family have been eating yeah. and that's what you do. Um, I, I love kreplach actually, but never make them. I mean, we do have a recipe in our first book for yes, prep love. Yes. And I think this year I might get to make some prep love. I mean, it is time consuming. You've got to make yes, the, absolutely. you've got to make the dough and you've yes. got to roll it and you've got to fill them and da 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 da. But, yum. But if you're in Melbourne, you can go to Balaclava Deli and buy them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there's our layer cake. And, and 
I, I just want you to see how imperfect it is. You know, I haven't really taken too much care because it actually doesn't matter. Um, it just needs to be laid with enough cream inside to, to soften it. And now we're going to go around and do the whole thing. And this is the point where you realise you have or have not left enough mixture. And I think I probably have just. So I start at the top and I push it down the sides. And I've got a little bit more and then just go around like this. That's all you do. Around. Just show you what I'm doing. Okay, that's it. And the edges don't have to be fully covered. I, I quite like to see like a bit know. of the brown. You know, it's like yes. those beautiful naked yes. cakes that they're doing. Absolutely. And that's the look that we're going for. I probably did use a little bit much inside now that I see that. But it's okay. You'll forgive me. So I'm just going to press it down gently. Okay. And let's just do this. So beautiful and so simple. It really is. It really, really is. And the best part is that you can make it in advance yeah and it's not so the pressure's off and you have a beautiful dessert I'm trying to do it so you can see it it's a bit awkward but i think everyone can see so this is what i'm doing all the way around and the top just needs to be smooth it doesn't need to be completely 100 percent covered as i said you'll see the one i've done earlier how lovely it looks when it sets so pretend that I've done that properly. I'll straighten it a bit with my hands because it is a bit skewed at the moment. And now it goes into the fridge. And now it goes into the fridge. So let's pretend it's beautifully covered all the way around. I'm going to take this and put it into my Tupperware container and put it in the fridge. And that can be, look, it can be overnight, but I think it needs at least 24 hours. And 36 is actually even better. Okay. So that's the cake done. Get rid of that. Now, the one I made earlier. So I made this one on Friday um, and I want to show you what happens to it. Could you also pass the cake tray over here? Thanks. So this is the one I made the other day. When it goes in the fridge for two days, you don't want to cover it directly with plastic wrap because it will stick. Right. So you try to leave it open in the air in a container like this. See why you need the baking paper to take it out? Mm -hmm. And that okay. is the cake. Um, if you don't like the look of the baking paper, mine's a bit messy, I must agree with you, those of you who are thinking that. Um, see, it's a bit cream cheesy around the edges. Then you can just get a big spatula and lift it off. Right. Right. There are a few tiny, tiny little cracks um, on the top from the fridge. And what you can do is you can dip your um, palette knife into boiling water right, and just, and just smooth, smooth it out. Right. And what I'd like to do, I'm just going to get some boiling water here for one second to show you what I would do. Because I think it looks nice to be garnished with uh, the, hazelnuts. the hazelnuts. Right. So I've just run this under boiling water and I'm just gently going to do that and all the cracks go. Right. And as well as that, it makes the top a little bit moist so that the hazelnuts will stick. Right. You can also put the hazelnuts on before you put it in the fridge. Okay. But I'm most excited to show you what it looks like inside because it's Look really, at that. really good. Isn't that just wonderful? Now, in our book, funnily enough, the stylist who who shot the who shot the book with us, when you when you do a cookbook, you have a whole team. There's all of us yeah. cooking, right? You know, the Monday Morning Cooking Club girls are doing all the cooking. Then you have a food stylist. And then you have a photographer and the food stylist, we've made the cake, but he'll then take the cake and cut it in a certain way and put it on the right plate, but it's everything we've made. So he decided in the photo in the book to drizzle honey on top of it yes. after it was cut. Yes. It's not in the recipe <laughs> and it's not what we perhaps may have done ourselves, but now every time someone makes it, they drizzle it with honey. honey. So it's, it's your beautiful. choice if you want to drizzle or not. Um, somebody has asked, um, um, uh, good Jewish supermarkets that you can purchase food online in Melbourne. 
I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, but if you wanted cooked food, I would go to Balaclava Jelly. It's not kosher, but it's it's absolutely outstanding. She makes the best chicken soup and matzo balls and crepla and meat blintzes. I could go on. Um, so sorry, I don't know the answer no, to the Melbourne no, the Melbourne no, question. No. Sorry, maybe someone else can answer. Oh, Kosher Kingdom. There you go. There you go. Uh, and Coles have lots of kosher food. Um, oh, Miriam says Danish Nosh. I love this community that we've got here. <laughs> it's so good. Everybody's helping. All the kosher caterers will do and deliver also, Lorraine says. Yes. Great. Thank you, Lorraine. Okay, are we ready? Yes. I didn't, what I didn't get is plates for us to eat. So bear with me. You, you okay. chat to everybody and I'll okay. be back in one second. Okay. This is so much fun being in this Monday morning cooking club kitchen with these. And this recipe is absolutely beautiful. I really would have found it quite daunting to do. Um, and now I think I'm making this for the show now. <laughs> Oh, oh dear. Okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's one of those days again. One of those days. I again. think it's like a, another non cake day becomes a cake day. Is that what it is? That's what it is. All right. So I'm just putting this aside. Sorry. Okay. I just want to make sure everybody gets a really nice view of this magnificent cake. Very excited to show you. And when you cut it, you saw that they were crisp biscuits. Okay. So yeah. now it is, it's not oh, soft like a. Um, like a sponge cake. Right. I've chosen the wrong knife for sure. I should really have a big knife for this, but anyway. So it cuts really nicely, but it's not going to feel like a sponge cake because you still want these biscuits to have texture. Right. You don't want it to be nothing. It's got to have, it, it's, that's what's so good about it. It's a big piece, isn't it? Oh, no. All right. Look at that. Wait till you see this. <gasps> <laughs> Look at that. Can everyone see? So that? I just want it's, wow. it's really lovely. Wow, wow, wow. Have a look at that. Right. Can and you can see, see that? how beautiful All it looks beautiful inside. Layers. I'm going to cut one more piece for me. Look at that. Wow. So as I said, don't, so it, don't the expect it. Fine. It's just beautiful. Don't expect it to be as soft as a sponge because that's not what it is. This is a cake with with substance and texture, and that's what you want. It's not and mushy also honey. Also, the layers. layers, the layers of the cream cheese and the cream cheese mixture, it's not thick layers. They've almost sunk mm. into the biscuit. It's just lovely. Um, um, okay, yeah. sorry, everybody. I apologize that we get to taste this. <laughs> so, it's so delicious. Exquisite. What I like about it's it is it's not too creamy. The cream is just becomes part of the layers, right? Mm. It's not a, it's not like a cake made and of you can cream really taste, only. And you can really test the honey. But you can really see that I've started off with less, less cream at the bottom layers and more at the top. So I think it's important probably if you're making it for something special like Rosh Hashanah to try to, to get to, the layers yeah, to even. Better than I, do a better job than I did. But it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Mm. And the honey, I love the honey that comes through. It's, it's just a really nice, very mellow cream and cream cheese filling with just a flavour of honey that just goes through every single bite. Um, I'm very happy. I could just run away now and eat it, but we won't because we've got a few more minutes to talk about. I think we should talk more about Rosh Hashanah yes. menus and what everybody's doing. So once we've had soup and we've had brisket and we've had salad, yeah, and we've had either green beans or spinach. We then come to dessert. Yeah, so so you could have you, well, you could have this. Depends if you got the meat milk issue. Yes. Right, um, right, I right. think that for me, I prefer this for afternoon tea on Rosh Hashanah. Um, I agree. It's just a meal. It's it's an afternoon tea cake. It's mm -hmm. really really special and lovely, and goes very well with a cup of tea for Rosh Hashanah night or erev Rosh Hashanah or first night or lunch or whatever you do. I always go back to the original honey cake, the standard yes. sticky honey cake baked in a tin. Uh, we've got one in our first book, which is on our website, which is called Gina's Hair Raising Honey Cake. And there's a new version of that in our new book called the Spiced Honey Cake. And it's a, we've halved it, so it's smaller, which is great for right. everybody in these times. Yes. And instead of the cocoa that was in it, we've added spices and tea. Oh, and it's just a slightly different version of the same amazing sticky cake. It's really worth everyone trying out. 
And if you do follow Monday Morning Cooking Club, we'll be doing um, two cook-alongs on the week leading up to Rosh Hashanah. And the idea is that everybody can actually make their honey cake with us oh, at the same time Wonderful. on the Tuesday before and then make their brisket with us on the Wednesday before. Oh, and then the brisket just goes in the fridge, the honey cake just goes in the pantry and then comes Friday night and dinner's pretty much done. And how long in advance do you make your honey cake? I think at its peak, I think three days. Right. Same day it, it no misses good. something. And could you freeze it? You could and you can. And it freezes quite well. I'm not. A, I'm not. I can't. I, you notice I know, I'm a bit I reluctant know, to say I know, that. I know. I'm not a freezer of cakes, but that one actually freezes quite well. Good. I remember Good. last Rosh Hashanah, we did so many demos and things that we had all these honey cakes in the freezer, and then you know, six months later, I found. The honey cake at the back of the freezer. I thought, oh, I'll see what it's like. It was actually really good. So it does freeze. Yeah, yeah. Um, this I wouldn't freeze um, because no. of the fresh cream. Yes. I think it's lovely as it is. Right, right. And then fruit as a dessert. Fruit. But don't you think everyone's stuffed after main course at Rosh Hashanah? I, I do. Does anyone ever want dessert? No, but I think people like fruit. Okay, so what about special fruit? We've got actually on the website also in the first book, um, Judy's sticky pears which are these slow roasted pears in wine and sugar and they are they're very sweet and they're perfect for Rosh Hashanah and I serve it just with vanilla ice cream or cream or yogurt or something like that it's a very nice dessert right. if you're looking for a dessert um, the other thing I should really mention is my auntie Myrna's carrot simus yes. if you make the brisket you don't need it because it's got the carrots in it but her simus is something else and also on the website everything's on the website um, and Maximus is legendary. It is, it is. And really it's got, beautiful. I mean, it's got lots of butter in it. So I guess you can do it with margarine if yes. you have to. I think it would be fine with yeah. margarine. Yeah. I think it would be fine with margarine. Um, and then there's also um, the Middle Eastern fruit compote. Ah, that's a great which one. Which is a lovely, which is, I mean, I love fruit compote yeah. always. What's good about that compote is that you do it all ahead and yes. you, there's no cooking. It's just put it in a dish and put it in the pantry or the fridge for two or three days. Yes. And in, the, in the third book, there are um, Marilyn's mum's uh, baked apples. Yeah, which, which is all, actually a very good dessert. Baked, baked apples are lovely. That's a good idea because it's fruity but not too sweet. It's, it's apples. Yeah, yeah. It's, it just works. It's yeah. a lovely recipe. There's so many options, but I've just got memories of Rosh Hashanah, era of Rosh Hashanah, and like stuffing, you know, soup and chopped liver and challah. And oh, we're going to talk about challah. I know we're running out of time. Let's just talk about challah. We have in our new book a apple, cinnamon, and honey challah. So we've taken our original Monday morning cooking club challah, which came from rabbits and honey wolf, and we've taken out a bit of the sugar and added a bit of honey in the dough. And then we, that's my dog, excuse him. Um, and then we've chopped, finally chopped some Granny Smith apples with cinnamon and sugar, spread it out all over the dough when you're rolling it, roll it into a, into a log and make a coil. And there's a beautiful, oh, beautiful challah for Rosh Hashanah. Fantastic. There's actually so much food. We could have another two hours talking about what we should be eating. <laughs> and, and so many people are making challah. It's just yeah. wonderful. I know. Um, I have to say that I, I follow your Insta stories each week. And I, I just love seeing everybody's fellow. So many just people are making wonderful. Color. It's a it's beautiful, beautiful thing. Wonderful. It's a really special thing to do. Mm. Now, someone's asked how long does it keep. I assume you're talking about this cake. Um, I would make it two days ahead of um, serving and... Well, how long does fresh cream keep? Probably another two days. Yes, two yeah. to three days. Yeah, not that it's yeah. going to last that long because no. it's so delicious. It's definitely going to not going to last mm. that long. I hope that all of you will go and try this cake now. And please send messages either to the Great Synagogue's Instagram or to Monday Morning Cooking Club's Instagram or Facebook. We'd love to see pictures of your cake. We'd love to see, to hear how you went cooking it. It gives me great nuffers to get photos from people of what they've been cooking. Absolutely.